Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to tell you which mode of convergence is stronger than the other. So the theorem I'm looking at is the following. Xn converges to x almost surely implies uh, xn going to x in probability. Oops. Which in turns imply in turn implies xn going to x weekly. Okay, so remember this was a that we had two notations for weak convergence, uh, xn going to x weekly, or we also said we also denoted this by a w over the arrow, same thing. Okay, and furthermore, LP convergence, xn going to x in LP for any p positive, also implies in probability convergence. Okay, that's the, that's the theorem I want to prove. So it's three statements in one. Statement A, almost sure implies in probability. Statement B, LP implies in probability. Statement C, in probability implies weak. Okay, three statements. So let's prove this, all three separately. The proof of A is simple once we have the previous statement in hand. Uh, xn converges to x almost surely was seen to be equivalent to the probability that take the supremum k at least n xk minus x larger than epsilon goes to zero for every epsilon as n goes to infinity. Okay, so this is for every epsilon. This, this was a theorem we saw, we just proved uh, before, so just seen in the previous video. All right. And now, uh, the claim is the following. If I look at the probability that without a supremum, xn minus x is larger than epsilon, if xn minus x is larger than epsilon, then the supremum of the xk is at least n, k at least n, is also larger than epsilon. So if this event occurs, then that event occurs as well, which means that the uh, probability of the top event is larger than or equal than the probability of the bottom event. So the probability that supremum larger than epsilon is always larger than or equal than the probability that the nth term minus x is, is larger than epsilon. And therefore, if this probability goes to zero, it follows that this probability also goes to zero. And that's exactly in probability convergence. So that's the proof of part A. It's pretty simple. Part B is also not very hard. So we are assuming LP convergence and we want to show in probability convergence. And to this order, I'm going to look at what we need for improbability convergence, xn minus x mod larger than epsilon, what's the probability of that? The first thing I'm going to do is, for any positive p, I'm going to make use of the fact that on positive numbers, the p's power is an increasing function. So if I take xn minus x to the p's power, that's larger than epsilon to the p, exactly when xn minus x is larger than epsilon. That's just uh, increasing mass of the p power function. Okay, <clears throat> now comes Markov's inequality. It's a simple Markov's inequality, which says that the probability a positive random variable is larger than a bound is bounded from above by the expectation of that positive random variable. So expectation of xn minus x to the p divided by the bound I have, which is epsilon to the p. And LP convergence exactly said that this expectation goes to zero, as n goes to infinity. LP convergence, the definition of LP convergence, was exactly that this expectation will go to zero as n goes to infinity. 
and epsilon is fixed at the same moment, so for every epsilon we have this convergence. And that's the end of the proof. So that's the proof of part B. Part C will be a little bit more involved. So to prove part C, I need a couple of inputs. The first input is that I need to take a, a bounded function G g of x is less than c for every x. This is the function g on which I need to take expectations for the definition of weak convergence. So this is going to be the function g, any bounded fu continuous function g. Let me add here continuous. On which I'm going to take expectations of uh, g of x g of xn actually, and I need to show that that converges to the expectation of g of x, right, to get the uh, convergence weakly, the weak convergence uh, using this uh, bounded test function. Okay, now any continuous function will be uniformly continuous on a compact interval, and here's how I'm going to make my compact interval. So the next step I'm going to do is x has a distribution, the limiting random variable x has a distribution, and for every epsilon, there's going to be an n such that the probability of x being outside the range minus an n is less than whatever number I want. And in fact, I want, instead of epsilon, I'm going to put here epsilon over 4c, where c is this number here. That's just because x has a distribution. And if you go far enough with the distribution, then the probability of the far enough tail is as small as you want. So that's the second uh, choice, fixing an epsilon. I'm going to pick an n for which this is true. And now the third choice I'm going to make is that for that n interval, uh, g is going to be uniformly continuous. on minus 2n, 2n. That's a fact from analysis. If you have a continuous function and we restrict it on a, a compact interval, uh, closed and uh, bounded interval, then it becomes uniformly continuous. What does that mean? With my epsilon, I can actually pick a delta positive such that the function values g of x minus g of y can be made smaller than epsilon over 2c by taking x and y closer to each other than delta. And of course I need them to be in this interval. So x and y are of course in minus 2n, n. Uh, sorry, minus 2n plus 2n. Okay, they need to be in that interval. Right, so these are my inputs. Again, <laughs> that uses the distribution of x, it uses the boundedness of g, and it uses that continuous bounded fu continuous functions are uniformly continuous on compact intervals. And so I'm looking at uniform continuity in this third input. And now I can start writing my uh, expression I want to bound. So what do I need to bound? I need to look at the expectation of gxn, this guy needs to converge in n to the expectation of gx. So I'm going to look at the difference of these things. Notice that at this point these random variables could be defined on any probability space. However, we're proving part c of this theorem, which means that we have improbability convergence to start with. So in fact x and xn, xn and x if you wish, are defined on the same probability space. And therefore, I can use a common expectation on these. This makes perfect sense if we have the same probability space for the two set of random variables for x, n, and x. Just linearity of expectations. And now I can use a triangle inequality to actually Jensen's inequality, not triangle, it's, it's more Jensen's inequality to bring the absolute value inside the expectation. The absolute value is a convex function. Homework, check this. So now I have the 
absolute value of gxn minus gx under the expectation. Okay, this is my uh, first line of thought. And now I'm going to split things according to according to the cases outlined above. I'm going to change color here. Maybe it makes it a little bit more readable. So this thing here is equal to the expectation of gxn minus gx and here I'm going to take an event and my first event will be the following xn minus x mod smaller than or equal to delta and also mod of x is smaller than or equal to n that's the first bit of my expectation and here I want to explain something notation notation is that expectation of a random variable z on an event e is denoted like this so this is just the expectation of the random variable z times the indicator of the event e okay that's just the notation above so that's my first uh, line the second uh, term i'm going to make here is plus expectation of the same thing g of x n minus g of x on the event that x n minus x is less than delta so far the same thing but on this one x mod is larger than n okay so this was my second term and then I have a third term expectation of gxn minus gx mod on the event on the event that xn minus x is larger than delta okay so what is going on here I have some indicators in after the semicolons uh, the difference less than delta x less than n the difference less than delta x larger than n and the difference larger than delta these three events are exclusive and they span all the possible cases they span all the sample space if i add up these three indicators here so the indicator of this long one the indicator of this other long one and the indicator of this simple one then this indicator is always one and therefore all I did here is just split that expectation using linearity of expectations. It was just a probabilistic split using linearity of expectations. Essentially I was just partitioning the sample space into three different cases. Case 1, case 2, case 3. So what's coming next is showing that each of these cases is small. Okay. What's coming next on the next page is to show is showing that uh, each of these expectations is small okay so page three now why is the first event the first expectation small if x mod is less than n then x is obviously in the minus 2 and 2 n interval if xn minus x is less than delta then x ends at least for small enough delta which is fine because delta is small is uh, small enough so i can choose i can always choose a smaller delta that's fine or a larger n so x and minus x less than delta and x less than n means that xn is also in this interval minus 2 and 2n so this event makes it sure that both xn and x are included in minus 2 and 2n in other words uniform continuity applies and also xn minus x is less than delta which delta was chosen to make sure that g of the x and g of the y value is close enough to each other so it's smaller than epsilon over 2c in other words if xn minus x is smaller than or equal to delta then i know that gxn minus gx is smaller than epsilon over 2c so my first uh, expression 
is at most epsilon over 2c, which I'm going to record here. Epsilon over 2c for my first one. Okay, what can I say about my second event or second expectation? So for the second expectation, I'm out of range. I'm not in the uniform continuity interval, which means that I cannot apply anything uniformly continuous. I'm just going to make a very crude bound. I'm just going to say that G is bounded by C, so this difference is bounded in mod. It's bounded by 2C. Whatever I do, this thing cannot be larger than 2C. Okay? Um, if, it's, if it's less than 2C, um, then I'm just going to bound the expectation of the indicators. I'm also going to drop this indicator here. I'm just looking at that indicator there. Expectation of this indicator is bounding. If I take 2C factor out, it's bounding all of that expectation. So let's record that. So I'm going to add here 2C expectation of this indicator. What is the expectation of an indicator? It's of course the probability of the event I have in this indicator. So I have that for my second term. And then let's take a look at this third term. Expectation of G and minus G and Xn minus X larger than delta. Okay, what can I say about Xn minus X larger than delta? Obviously, if these are far away from each other, xn is far from x, then I can't expect g of xn to be close to g of x. So again, I'm going to just bound this term by 2c. And then I'm just having the probability of xn minus x larger than delta. Okay. Uh, mod xm minus x larger than delta. So this is my bound for this is my bound for e of gxn minus e of gx. Okay. Now the probability of x bigger than n was set to be epsilon over 4c. That's how I picked my number n. I bound n. So this term here is bounded from above by epsilon over 4c. And in the first one, in this first bound, I'm now realizing I don't need the C actually. So let's get rid of that C. Everything I said works true. And then I don't have the C there. I don't need that. So now let's combine everything we have. We have an epsilon over 2. We have another epsilon over 2 from here. 2, uh, two C and epsilon over 4c, and then we have 2c times the probability that xn minus x is bigger than delta. Now the assumption for this theorem, we're doing part c, so the assumption was that we have in probability convergence, meaning that this probability goes to zero. For every delta, this goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So in particular, we can pick a large enough n, which makes this for, for the given uh, delta, this makes this smaller than, again, epsilon over 4c, if n is large enough. What, what large enough means depends on delta, but that's fine. And if we do that, then the whole uh, thing will be smaller than... Uh, Okay, let's put a 2 here and then I end up with two epsilons, doesn't matter. Epsilon half plus epsilon half plus, two epsi plus uh, epsilon, which is two epsilon instead of one epsilon. I could have done one epsilon here, but that's how it ended up, doesn't matter. So what did we conclude? We concluded that the expectation, uh, previous page, we concluded that the expectation of Gxn, e of gxn minus e of gx can be made smaller than 2 epsilon by taking n large enough for every epsilon. And that's exactly what we need to prove to see weak convergence. So that finishes the proof of part C.